and even to help drifting churches recover a biblical philosophy of ministry. A sixth goal in a series like ends up being. A seventh goal, and this one's particular for today's message, is to prepare you to be cared for in the local church. Our text this morning is shepherd the flock as a directive to pastors. You have to understand that shepherds may step into your life to give spiritual care by the Lord's direction. And you might be thankful for that or you might be threatened by that. But you need to understand that a pastor's job description does not come from the pastor. And a pastor's job description does not come from the world. And a pastor's job description does not even come from the church itself and its members. The task of shepherding, what shepherding is and the way it is to be carried out, comes from God through his word. I think it's helpful to know that up front so that when a small group leader asks me questions about my heart or a pastor is trying to help me see how the word of God may confront some wrong thinking or some errant behavior in my life, that that is not intrusive or abnormal behavior in the context of a local church. It might feel awkward if my idea of church is more consumer-driven. You know, I, I show up for Sundays to get a product, I'm the consumer, the church is the provider, the, the leadership of the church, they're the dispensers of this product. I, I want to go to church on a Sunday and, and get some entertainment or maybe some intellectual stimulation, a, a motivational pep talk, an emotional pick-me-up, some feel-good music, some casual relationships, some life hack self-help tips. That's what I'm there for. And all of a sudden, if that's your mindset about what church is, and you step into a body of believers that are organically connected to one another and actually care for each other's souls, and, and that body of believers is being led and cared for by men who answer to God for the way they give soul care, then it might come as a shock when somebody asks you about your heart or your motives. But that is real and normal body life in the context of the local church. It's important for you to know that because hopefully that is what you will experience. So this morning, oh, I have one more goal. I was going to save it to the end. I'll give you the preview now and then uh, we'll come back to this in the end. Um, if the world needs more faithful shepherds, where will it find them? I think those shepherds will be found in the context of a local church where good shepherding is being practiced. And so churches with a biblical philosophy of ministry ought inevitably to be producing more pastors. And we want to talk this morning about how we collectively as a church have been intentional about that and want to be more intentional about that. So this morning, shepherd the flock, 1 Peter 5, 1 to 4. Let's read this text together. Peter writes this, therefore, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to God. And not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. I've already given you eight points, and that was not the outline. I'm now going to give you another outline, which is not the sermon outline this morning. I have it up on the screen for you, and this is the grammatical outline of 1 Peter 5, 1 to 4, so that you can sort of see visually what this passage is doing in four verses. In verse 1, Peter is introducing himself as he exhorts pastors. Peter tells us he is exhorting the pastors among the believers, and he describes himself and his own ministry in that. And then he goes on in verse 2 to tell those pastors whom to pastor, in verses 2 and 3, how to pastor, and in verse 4, why to pastor. Whom to pastor, how to pastor, 
and why to pastor. That, that is what 1 Peter 5, 1 to 4 uh, is doing grammatically. And the main idea of 1 Peter 5, 1 to 4, I would say this way. The apostle Peter, with empathy and humility, looking back to the cross and ahead to glory, exhorts the qualified men among the people to carry out pastoral responsibility by overseeing God's precious people with eagerness, generosity, and imitable leadership, accountable to Jesus Christ, and motivated by eternal reward. That is way too many words to put up on the screen. Oh, I did put it on the screen. It's there. I don't even have to say it twice. You read it while I was reading it. In order to break that down into some bite-sized pieces, we're going to look at this passage not in three points, but in 14 points. So finally, here's your sermon outline for this morning. We're going to observe 14 features of Peter's instructions to pastors so that we might understand some of the critical elements of pastoral ministry. We're going to observe 14 features of Peter's instructions to pastors. The first thing we're going to observe is empathy. Empathy. We see this in verse 1. Peter begins this section simply by saying, therefore. And when you see the therefore, you're supposed to ask, what's the therefore? Therefore. What the therefore is therefore is to connect verses 1 to 4 of chapter 5 to the previous sections in 1 Peter. Uh, A fairly simple principle. What's immediately in the context of 1 Peter chapter 4, specifically verses 12 to 15, is instructions to believers in the churches about suffering. And it is a theme throughout the book of 1 Peter. And it is a pointed description in this immediate context. Peter is writing to groups of believers who are suffering for their adherence to Christ. And so, chapter 5, verse 1, the therefore links pastoral instructions to the real suffering of the people that pastors care for. It's important that Peter emphasize this because he's demonstrating an empathy with the people who are to be cared for as he's given instructions to those who are to care for them. It's a reminder to pastors, listen, your people are suffering. Your people are having a hard time in life. Therefore, I urge you, care for them, shepherd them, care for their souls. And the empathy that Peter himself is modeling and demonstrating is to be picked up on by the pastors he's instructing A second feature is also in verse 1, and I would say it this way, maturity, maturity. Notice what Peter says, therefore I exhort the elders. He's speaking to the elders. And this is the word presbyteros. This is one of three interchangeable titles for pastor in the New Testament. In fact, all three of those titles are given in this very very passage. Elder in verse 1, pastor in verse 2, and overseer in verse 2. The word pastor comes from the verb to shepherd, and overseer is from the verb to exercise oversight. Pastor, shepherd are one idea, Uh, elder, another term, and overseer, a third term. All three of those terms used interchangeably for the office of pastor. It, It is why we use those terms interchangeably when we talk about the elders of this church. They are the pastors of this church. They are the overseers of these of this church. Shepherd, pastor, overseer. Elder, all the same office. And the word elder is used to highlight the maturity and the qualification of the men who hold this office. Uh, Elder kind of sounds like the word older. And while it doesn't necessarily demand an age, it does demand a spiritual maturity. You know that Timothy was a younger elder, But he was qualified in character and ability and knowledge as an elder in the church. Critical to pastoral ministry is the reality that pastors in the church must be qualified men. They must be spiritually mature. They must be elders. They must meet the qualifications for being elders as laid out in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1. A third feature we must see in Peter's exhortation to elders is plurality. We see that also in verse 1, again, in the word elder, notice that elder is plural. I exhort the elders among you. Elders is plural here. In fact, all of the verbs in this text are 
second person plural commands. Y'all do this. Y'all do that. Y'all do this. Right? It's good Southern and good Greek. It may not be great English, but that's what the text says. It's interesting to note that elder is always in the plural in the New Testament when describing the ministry in the local church. It's always elders in local churches. There are a few places where the word elder shows up as a singular here in 1 Peter 5.1 where Peter calls himself a fellow elder. But you understand he's grouping himself, again, not an apostle over the elders, but grouping himself with local church pastors. And then John the Apostle does the same thing in 2 John uh, verse 1. And the only other place it shows up as a singular is if someone brings an accusation against an elder. But even then, it's an elder amongst a group in the context of the local church. When the Bible speaks of the ministry of elders in the local church, it is always plural. God has designed that each local church be governed by a plurality of qualified men. And this protects against error, imbalance, The domineering uh, mindset of one guy getting his way all the time. It also protects against a vacuum of leadership. If one of the elders uh, goes home to be with the Lord, or or moves somewhere else, or plants a church, or goes to Papua New Guinea, then there's not a vacuum of leadership. It's a protection against that. And it also provides for the varieties of gifting present in various men. Not one man has all the gifts required for pastoral ministry in the context of the local church. Here's a fourth feature for us to examine. It's in verse 1, proximity. Notice that Peter says, I exhort the the elders among you, among you. Now, the elders are among people. Now, who's the you in 1 Peter 5.1? This, of course, is the audience to whom Peter is writing this letter. And if you... Flip the page back to the left, and you look at 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, you read this. Here's Peter's address. Here's his salutation, his introduction. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who are chosen. Peter is writing to Christians, and these geographical place names at the time of Peter's writing were the provinces of of Asia Minor. It would be like talking about counties or even states within a region. These were the the areas geographically that constituted Asia Minor, which is now modern-day Turkey. Unknown, uh, it's unknown whether Peter ever visited these churches or ever interacted with these specific believers, but he's, he's writing to all of them in this region. And what I'd like us to notice is that the instructions are given to the elders among you. That is, the the pastors amongst these people are with these people in these various regions. They are proximate. Uh, They are near. They are in and amongst the Christians. And there's a principle here for us that you can't pastor from a distance, Pastors must be among the people that they care for. That will become evident in the other things Peter is going to tell us that these pastors are to do. There's a fifth feature we want to look at, and it is humility. We see this also in verse 1. How does Peter describe himself? I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder. Notice Peter does not say, as the apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ as High King Peter or some other such title. Just like the Apostle John in John's letter, he calls himself a fellow elder. I'm a, I'm a pastor with you men. That's a remarkable kind of humility. Peter modeled the kind of humility that elders are supposed to model. In fact, down in verse 3, Peter's going to tell the pastors to be examples to the flock, and he is doing that very thing here, speaking about his own ministry the way he does. A sixth feature we see in Peter's exhortation is the cross. Peter describes himself not only as a fellow elder, but also a witness of the sufferings of Christ in verse 1. And Peter's humility is on display here as well. He he doesn't say, he doesn't give his apostolic credentials. Uh, I'm the one who uh, could work signs and miracles, uh, and I'm the one who uh, saw the Lord raised from the dead. 
But what does Peter point to? A witness of Christ's sufferings. And if you think about this in relationship to Peter, it was probably Peter's most painful days. It was at the suffering of Messiah that Peter denied he even knew him. Calling down curses from heaven on the little girl who threatened Peter with that accusation. Peter's own greatest shame is on display here. But there's more. This reference to the sufferings of Christ also connects with the suffering that Peter's audience is undergoing. The Emperor Nero's persecution of Christians began in the fall of 64 AD. And 1 Peter was written sometime near the outbreak of that persecution, maybe a little before, maybe a little after. And Peter himself, according to church history, was martyred by Nero. This reminder of the sufferings of Christ uh, would be one more encouragement for people suffering for Christ's name. Additionally, the message of the suffering of Christ, the death of Christ in the place of sinners, was central to Peter's preaching and his ministry. Look back at 1 Peter 3.18. He wrote, For Christ also died, and the verb there is literally suffered, where we get the, the, the word for a paschal lamb, the Passover lamb, the suffering lamb. Christ also died for sins once for all, the just in the place of the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh and made alive in the spirit. And Peter connects the substitutionary death of Christ to save sinners in verse 18 to the suffering of the people he was writing to in verse 17. And so even while Peter is comforting these precious saints in the midst of their suffering, he can't get away from the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ, the only hope for mankind, the only way that sinners are made right before a holy God is that God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, goes to the cross and actually pays for their sins, all their sins, past, present, and future, for everyone who would ever believe to bring us to God. Peter can't get away from the gospel. Peter highlights here the sufferings of Christ as central to his ministry. Even in reminding the pastors, what are you supposed to be doing? <laughs> he can't help but remind them about the sufferings of Jesus Christ. As a pastor, Peter was marked by looking back to the cross of Christ. A seventh feature is what Peter was looking forward to, glory. Peter's ministry was marked by a looking forward to glory. He says it this way, he was also a partaker of the glory that is to be revealed. He is a partaker, literally a, a sharer or a fellow in coming glory. Peter's pastoral ministry was marked by eternal perspective. It's important for a body of believers under persecution, a body of believers facing suffering. It's also important for a body of believers who are relatively free from the kind of suffering that Asia Minor faced. In fact, garnering an eternal perspective, looking back at the cross and looking forward to glory would be especially important for us who might be tempted to be indifferent by eternal realities, because life is very comfortable. That eternal perspective marked Peter's ministry, and he reminded that, uh, he, he brought that to mind in his exhortation of pastors in chapter 5. An eighth feature of Peter's encouragement, exhortation, is the exhortation to responsibility. Responsibility in verse 2. And a very serious and sobering responsibility. Here's how Peter states it. Shepherd the flock of God among you. Here's a command, a directive to pastors. Shepherd the flock of God among you. This is a very personal command for Peter. You'll remember that after he denied Christ and tried to go back to his old employment, and Jesus came to him at the lake and said, listen, I can provide you all the fish you want if you want to go after stuff with fins and scales. But here's what I want you to do, Peter. Shepherd my sheep. And here, Peter, passing on that very command, 
You can hear the echoes of it here. Shepherd the flock of God among you. What Peter heard in John 21, now the pastors in Asia Minor here. The pastor is not to be a speech writer, an entertainer. Uh, he is not to be the center of a consumer mindset gathering of people looking for a product. No, he is to be a shepherd of sheep. Shepherd is the word um, related to our English word pastor. It's where we get the word pastor from the idea of shepherding. These really are synonyms. Shepherd, obviously, is a metaphor from a realm which we are not familiar. At least, I'm not familiar. It wasn't until I was uh, probably in my 30s at a zoo when I actually touched a real live sheep. I only became accustomed to sheep and to shepherds through Bible stories and, and flannel graph boards and cartoons. In the ancient Near East, in the Middle East today, and in a number of cultures around the world, you, you can still interact with real sheep and real shepherds. And it is a fitting analogy for the relationship between people who need the kind of care that we need and a God who gives the kind of care that God gives. We are like sheep in that we need to be fed and led and protected from danger. And we don't have the resources to do those things ourselves very well. And the kind of care that God gives is a kind of feeding and leading and protecting from danger like a shepherd does for sheep. It reflects the, the kind of care that pastors are to give in the local church. Uh, it, God's care for us is reflected in preaching, in teaching, in giving soul care. You have to understand that preaching is not pastoral ministry. In other words, it's not the totality of pastoral ministry. Preaching is an indispensable subset of pastoral ministry. You can't shepherd if you're not preaching, teaching God's word. But you can be teaching God's word and not shepherding souls. Preaching, pastoral care, um, shepherding ministry, they overlap, but they're not equal. Pastoral ministry goes far beyond the pulpit. I heard recently uh, from one of our own pastors of a church that he visited that took as its model a, a conference church where every week was a different brought-in speaker, kind of like a conference every single Sunday. And they had big-name, high-end conference speakers come and deliver Sunday sermons. And what the church lacked was shepherding care. There are multi-site churches where pastors preach in one church and it gets broadcast to other locations. And perhaps some of those multi-site churches do other things to shepherd people, do all the other things that pastoral ministry entails. But in some places, they don't do that. I've even heard of hologram shepherding, where in a multi-site church setting, they want to give the illusion that the pastor is actually present, and they'll use technology to provide that illusion. And the pastor may be on one location one week and another location another week and another location another week. And the hologram looks so real that you're not sure if he's really there or not. Well, my friends, he's not really there. Already in that model and that mindset, he's not in and among the people caring for their souls. Pastoral ministry ought to reflect the character of God's care for us. You can read about God's shepherding care for his people in places like Psalm 23. You can read about Jesus as the good shepherd who lays his life down for the sheep in John chapter 10. And you can contrast that with a chapter like Ezekiel 34. I would encourage you to read that later today. What did the shepherds of Israel do when they failed as shepherds? They still had the title, still had the position, but they weren't doing the work as God described this responsibility of shepherding the flock is delegated and it's personal. 
It's delegated in that this is God's flock, right? Make no mistake, the, the, the people in the church are not the pastor's people. They're God's people. A pastor is a steward, not an owner, and this is a serious responsibility. God loves his sheep more than pastors ever could, and pastors are held accountable to God for the way they cared for and didn't care for the sheep. And this responsibility is personal. It is the flock of God among you. Again, proximity, nearness, real people with real needs. Shepherding ministry requires being with people, knowing people, caring for people personally. The pastor's job is to care for the sheep. This is an important principle for Grace Bible Church. Shepherd the flock. What is the direct object of that simple sentence? The flock, that is the sheep, that is God's people assembled here at this church, that is Christians. Pastor's primary responsibility is to shepherd the Christians that are here, not shop for the Christians that aren't yet. Now, we love evangelism. The local church is the vehicle that God will use to bring people from every tongue, tribe, nation, and people to himself and surround the throne of the Lamb with worshipers. But the church gathered is not the primary place of evangelism. You'll hear more about that in another sermon in this series. A ninth feature of Peter's instruction to pastors is oversight. Oversight. Chapter 5, verse 2, Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight. Exercising oversight is all one word in the original, and it's where we get our word for overseer. Or episkopos. It is literally to, to oversee, and it has the idea of guarding, standing as a sentry, and, and being aware of what is going on, a knowledge of needs and challenges and threats and concerns in the flock of God. It requires awareness and vigilance. What follows in the next features are three descriptions of how oversight is to be given. What does oversight look like? It is to be eager, generous, and followable. A tenth feature of Peter's instruction to pastors is eagerness. Notice in verse 2, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily. And numbers 10, 11, and 12, these three features that describe oversight are paired with a, a negative prohibition and a positive encouragement. We are to exercise oversight as pastors, not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to God. That, that is, you have to want to do it. This is not something that you're compelled to do by some outside constraint, uh, somebody uh, keeping a, a time card and, and giving you a, a list of things that, that you must do within a certain period of time, and when you do those, you're off, you're free. But an eagerness for the work that just drives a man to care for people. And then notice the phrase, according to God. Some of your translations have according to the will of God. It just means in keeping with God's standard, with the way God cares for his people. The 11th feature is generosity. And the way Peter words it is, not for sordid gain, but with eagerness. That is, not a mercenary disposition, but an eager disposition, not a hired hand in it only for the money, on the clock and then uh, stopping when the paycheck isn't there. A sordid gain would be the illegitimate grasping for money or advantage. Ministry is not to be a means to prosperity or self-advancement. Pastoral ministry is an eager generosity. That is, rather than taking from the sheep, giving and giving and giving, giving self away for others rather than taking from others for self. In Ezekiel chapter 34, the, your homework for this afternoon, the wicked shepherds of Israel were excoriated by God for fleecing the sheep, literally taking the wool for themselves, which they weren't, shepherds weren't allowed to have, it didn't belong to them, taking the milk for themselves. Shepherds in the ancient Near East were allowed to drink milk, but they weren't allowed to take it and sell it. And... They were actually slaughtering and eating the sheep that they were supposed to be protecting from danger. 
All of that is an illustration of the spiritual leaders of Israel. What were they doing? Devouring God's people, stealing from God's people, lording it over God's people instead of laying down their lives to feed and lead and protect and care for them. In Ezekiel 34, God promised to come personally and deliver his people from those wicked shepherds and to be his people's real shepherd. And Jesus fulfills that in John 10. You think about pastoral ministry and and ways that it's different than a lot of other occupations. Most jobs reward productivity with remuneration. And, And rightfully so, you build more widgets, you make more revenue. You increase your efficiency, you get better personnel, you improve the supply chain, you do more effective marketing, you increase uh, morale and the workplace environment, you do some quality control, you get better margins, you make more money. There's incentive to do that and to do it well, and it benefits employees, it benefits customers, it benefits the bottom line, but that's not the way a pastor thinks or ought to think. He is to be faithful to God's instructions a steward of God's resources, and a shepherd of God's people. He's not asking, how can I make more widgets to make more money? He's saying, what are the needs of God's people and how can I meet them? And pastors would do this for free. Pastors would pay to do this. The pastor's task is to give himself unreservedly to the work of shepherding God's people. The opposite of that perspective is a mercenary spirit. Oh, I don't get paid enough to answer the phone at this time of night. I'm only going to do ministry to the degree that I get paid for it, or maybe I'll pick ministry opportunities that benefit me personally. At times, Paul took up making tents, a part-time job, so as not to burden the church. That same Paul took support, recommended support, said that pastors were worthy of that financial support, and quoted Jesus in saying the workman is worthy of his wages, and endorsed the making of a living by gospel ministry. And we see both of those realities at Grace Bible Church. Two of your pastors are engineers. One built and retired from his own business. One of your pastors is a banker. One of your pastors puts surgical patients to sleep, sedator on his license plate, is a reference to Jake's mode of income, not his mode of teaching God's word. (laughs) And you know that. It's what he does with patients at the hospital, not people in the church. Three of your pastors are employed full-time by the church to give all of their time and energies to shepherding in this body. So you see, they're a combination of those biblical principles. But every one of the pastors at at this church would continue to pastor this body of believers even if there were no resources available to support them. Number 12, followability, verse 3. Exercising oversight, verse 3, not as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And and those of you who love grammar and you're looking it up, you're right. Followability is not an English word. I know that. The the correct word is imitability. That's just, I practiced it, and I couldn't say it well enough to put it in the outline. Peter says, not as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. Uh, Lording, to, to dominate, to exact one's will upon another. The church... And pastoral ministry is to not be about lording, but leading. Not dictatorial, but exemplary. A type or an example to follow. The pastor doesn't say, do what I say. But says, come with me and and do as I do. You've probably heard Tom Angstead say it this way. I am just one beggar helping another beggar to find the bread. This means that a pastor has to know where he's going. And he has to be exemplary, followable. His character and his life and his behavior and his pursuit of Christ must be worth imitating. Not perfect. By the way, all of these things we're reading about this morning are the things the elders aim at, not the things that the elders of this church have perfected. But they're imitatable. A pastor is not to be a dictator. 
And woe to the man who says, I want to be a pastor so I can finally make church be the way I want it to be. And and woe to the church who hires that man. Number 13, accountability. This is in verse 4. The chief shepherd appears. When the chief shepherd appears, the, the chief shepherd is coming back. This chief shepherd is all one word. It's the only time this word is used in the New Testament. The true shepherd of the sheep is coming back. And this is sobering and encouraging for all those who would be under shepherds or pastors in the local church. There is an accountability to what we do. And number 14, motivation. Verse 4, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Uh, For a pastor, this is some delayed gratification. Uh, Payday is later. The reward is after. Pastors labor for what they themselves cannot produce, the results of which they do not often see, and the rewards of which are delayed beyond this present life. Like all of the Christian life, there are rewards for loving Christ and serving him well. Jesus will reward deeds you did for him and for his glory and by his power. That's another sermon. It's true for pastors too. A pastor has to remember that he labors not for temporal gains, but primarily for eternal ones. Listen, pastoral ministry is very rewarding. You get to be on the, on the front row watching what God is doing in real time, in real lives. And especially at GBC, it's a lot of fun. It's very rewarding. And yet if a pastor lives for the immediate reward, he will be grieved and disappointed and he'll quit and run away. Because pastoral ministry comes with the kinds of challenges that you wouldn't sign up for if you knew what they were. One faithful pastor put it this way, fervency springs from a vision of heaven's reward. Fervency springs from a vision of heaven's reward. I gave you eight reasons to do this philosophy of ministry series at the beginning. Uh, The eighth reason was about training another generation of shepherds, pastors, of men who will read passages like 1 Peter 5, 1 to 4, and, and this text would grip their hearts and they would say things like, oh, the, the, the world needs the gospel, the world needs local churches and local churches need faithful shepherds. I, I wanna aspire to that. And Grace Bible Church has been training another generation of pastors and wants to continue. I wanna tell you what we have been doing in training pastors at Grace Bible Church Uh, It's called Grace Bible Institute. And it is just one part of of a train of training men and women and equipping men and women in our church for ministry. But it is specific to training pastors. And we've been doing this because we believe that shepherds ought to be trained in the context of ministry in the local church. We believe that is the best place for pastors to learn ministry in the church. Not in an ivory tower academy, in a classroom primarily but in the context of the local church. And so our classrooms have been here. And you know that Zach Can and Matt Dodd and Jeremy Lehman and Tyler Azeltine have all participated in Grace Bible uh, Bible Institute as part of their equipping to take the gospel and the church and the word of God to the ends of the earth. You know that Josh, Josh Kelso, completed all four years of our GBI training It is a 104 credit hour seminary level master of divinity degree. That is Josh in class 12 to 16 hours per week for eight semesters, four years. Jeff Maxwell and Omri Miles are in the middle of it. They're in the thick of it right now. They're currently finishing up their fifth of eight semesters studying Greek and Hebrew and systematic theology, church history, biblical counseling, apologetics, evangelism, pastoral ministry, preaching, the things that we think the men need in the classroom to be well-equipped for the ministry. All the while serving in this church. 
you know Jeff and Omri teaching God's word, preaching, shepherding people, evangelizing in our community, serving in deacon roles, being discipled and mentored by the elders of this church, being blessed and encouraged by you, family, body of believers here. And they also have families and jobs outside this church. I didn't say they were sleeping at all. And Omri and Jeff, December 15th is coming. It's coming. That's what we have been doing. And that is what we would continue to do at Grace Bible Church, to to train men in this way for pastoral ministry. But I also want to tell you what we are investigating. We're investigating a relationship with a seminary that believes with all its heart that shepherds ought to be trained in the context of the ministry of the local church. And that seminary is called the Expositors Seminary. I put the website up on the screen so you can look it up and investigate it and and look through their website. This is a seminary that really is the fruit of the ministry of the local church. Much like what we've been doing here, uh, they've just been doing it longer and maybe better. Jupiter, Florida, and Grace Emanuel Bible Church have been the home for the Expositor Seminary. And now the Expositor Seminary is training men on the campuses of nine local churches. Jupiter, Florida, Atlanta, Georgia, Houston, Texas, Lynchburg, Virginia, Huntsville, Alabama, Jacksonville, Florida, Kansas City, Kansas, Grand Rapids, Michigan, and Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And it is taught by a faculty of men who have been training pastors in the local church for decades. And many of these are men you know. They have preached here. Their books are on our shelves and available at our book table. They are men who have trained and mentored some of the men here, and they have had impact on all of your lives, directly or indirectly. Men like George Zemeck, Jerry Ragg, Paul Lamey, Rick Holland, John Anderson, Matt Wehmeyer, and others. And they are investigating a relationship with us. Might Grace Bible Church be a campus for training pastors in the context of the local church with really rigorous classroom training. I think, well, how does that work? Do do guys have to move to Jupiter, Florida, or one of those other campuses? No, we actually set up a room with the technology for two-way communication so that you are actually in the classroom with nine other campuses and the students in their churches doing ministry in their churches, being mentored by, by by their elders, learning ministry while being in the classroom simultaneously. The Expositor Seminary, uh, a representation of the Expositor Seminary, will be visiting us January 10th through the 14th for a site visit to see uh, what does our campus look like, is it going to be amenable uh, to this kind of a relationship, and then to to think through all the implications for us as a body of believers. Do we want to partner with something like TES, and for them, do they want to partner with something like us? And so it's not a done deal. We're investigating that. We would like for you to pray for us. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about what's happening that weekend uh, of January 14th is the Sunday. We will be having meetings with them throughout the week. But on on that Sunday morning, Jerry Ragg from the Expositor Seminary, uh, a pastor at Grace Emanuel, is going to be preaching and talking about the training of men and the importance of the training of men here for us on Sunday morning. And then Sunday night, we're going to have a Sunday night service. That's Sunday night, January 14th. And you're going to get to hear from Jeff Maxwell and Omri Miles. Uh, they're going to be preaching, um, and they're going to be preaching back-to-back sermons as a, as a way for you to hear what they've been doing, uh, answers to the ways you've been praying for them, um, as well as an opportunity for us to um, hear from God's Word uh, in the ways that they've been studying so hard. And so the encouragement uh, from your elders is to look forward to that weekend, participate with that. If you have questions about that, we would love to hear those. We would love to be able to field those and even be able to interact with those questions when the faculty from Expositor Seminary are here. So you can serve us in that way as we investigate this relationship. And then if there's anything you'd like to know about that relationship, please don't hesitate uh, to to look for us and um, interact with us about that. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this morning, for this body of believers, for the ways that you have cared for us with your shepherding care. And even as Paul said 
in talking about his own ministry, who is adequate for these things? The shepherds of this church, the under shepherds under the chief shepherd, cry out that same refrain. Who is adequate for these things? Lord, what a great privilege it is to, to get to serve and be served by this body of believers, your precious flock. And we pray that you would accomplish all your good purposes in this church, not only in this generation, but for future generations. And would you be faithful to make your gospel and your church go to the ends of the earth to win worshipers for your glory in Jesus' name.